Meine Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich hier im Garten. Ich würde Ihnen sehr herzlich willkommen hier hier im Garten des Chancellors. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut, dass Sie hier sind. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut, dass Sie hier sind. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut, dass Sie hier sind. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut, dass Sie hier sind. Wir haben uns sehr gefreut, dass Sie hier sind. The results of our conversations, I think, are such as that we have every reason to be pleased. U.S.-American-German uh, relations are in an exceedingly healthy state. It's a very friendly atmosphere. That has become abundantly clear in all of our conversations. And I also think that there is a tremendous amount of agreement between the two of us and our two countries as regards the assessment of the situation around the world. Now, to begin with, we have uh, started very in to talk about very intensely about uh, U.S.-American-European relations. I think what the American president and the Russian president have uh, agreed together regarding questions of disarmament, but also regarding the process of approachment of Russia towards NATO, that that is of historic importance. And I would very much say that, uh, and we both agree that this process is going to be topped um, by what we're going to be doing in Rome on the 28th of May together. The world is going to be a safer place for it. And I think it's a tremendous success, not only of America, but of this special US-American president. We then obviously talked about the ongoing necessity to continue with our joint fight against uh, international terrorism. And uh, I have been able to brief uh, the President about my visit to Kabul and uh, about the necessity of uh, maintaining the uh, protection force on the ground, the ISAF. They are the the force to guarantee a minimum of security and therefore a minimum perspective of hope of reconstruction for people in this country. This is also important when we want to rebuild economic and social structures in the country. We're very much in agreement that uh, we have every reason to trust uh, the interim government with uh, interim President Karzai and to give them all of uh, the support that they need to move their country forward as, as a way of their own momentum. Now, we very much agree that uh, it is necessary and important to make sure we uh, move the peace process forward in the Middle East. I have uh, emphasized very strongly that uh, the, the President's speech in Washington was a milestone regarding this situation. He went in and made it abundantly clear what we all believe in, at least we too certainly believe in, that Israel has got a guaranteed briefed right of safe existence within strong and reliable borders, that it needs to be recognized by all of its neighbors, and that uh, by the end of the day, certainly, there is going to be an independent Palestinian state too. And we're very much agreed that uh, this is a job to be done by the uh, international community of states, certainly by by means of the quartet that arose from Madrid, the United States of America, the United Nations, Europe and Russia. Now this quartet is hopefully going to support the, the constructive process as well as they can because we really need stability and peaceful development for this region specifically. We very much share the concern about the existing conflict between Pakistan on the one hand side and, and India on the other hand. And we're very much uh, agreed that uh, we have to do whatever we can to bring a peaceful solution to this conflict. I mean, we must make sure that no further escalation happens over there. Now, moreover, we uh, addressed questions of uh, interest regarding trade with one another. We also addressed uh, some other issues uh, that are in existence uh, regarding our bilateral relations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chancellor, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here in uh, this historic city. I want to thank you for your hospitality. And 
Thank you for treating Laura so well. Uh, Chancellor and I have um, uh, met, I think it's now five times, and uh, I value our friendship. I appreciate the frank discussions we have. Uh, I'm here to let the German people know uh, how proud I am of our relationship, our personal relationship, and how proud I am of the relationship between our two countries. Now, Germany is a, an incredibly important ally uh, to the United States of America. Uh, we respect the German people. We appreciate democracy uh, in this land. Uh, we appreciate the the struggles that Germany has gone through. And we value the friendship going forward. My, my speech today uh, in the Bundestag will talk about the problems that we can solve together, that, uh, that we share so much, particularly when it comes to values, and a deep and abiding concern for, uh, for humanity and for peace. One of the things I like about Gerhard is he's willing to confront problems in an open way. And he is, hopefully like people consider me, a problem solver. That we're willing to use our respective positions to solve problems, such as making sure our respective homelands are secure from terrorist attack. I'm going to talk clearly about that today, about the need for us to continue to cooperate and to fight against terror, people who hate freedom, people who are challenging civilization itself. I want to thank, again, the German people and the German government for the commitment to Afghanistan. The Chancellor made a very tough, but I think correct decision in sending troops to Afghanistan. And those troops have performed brilliantly. I, I know you've lost life, as have we. And our hearts go out to the families who, uh, of the soldiers who died. But in my judgment, the sacrifice is necessary because we defend freedom. And freedom is precious. Uh, we talked about weapons of mass destruction and, and uh, the need for us to be concerned about weapons of mass destruction. As I will mention in my speech, one way to help our mutual security is to work together to solve uh, regional problems. And we spent a lot of time talking about the Middle East. The German government has been very helpful in uh, helping set the foundation for peace. Both of us agree that, uh, that there ought to be two states, uh, the Palestinian state and obviously the Israeli state, living side by side in peace. And we're working in that direction. Uh, the hot topic today, of course, in the world, and one that we spent a lot of time talking about is, uh, as, as Gerhard mentioned, uh, the India-Pakistan issue. Um, my point is, is that uh, we've got a reliable friend and ally in Germany. Uh, this is a confident country, led by a confident man. And that's good. That's good for world peace. It's good for... Uh, it's good for those of us who love and embrace freedom. So, Mr. Chancellor, thanks for, thanks for giving me a chance to come and visit with you. Thanks for your hospitality. Thanks for giving me a chance to speak uh, to the Bundniks out here in a little bit. And we'll be glad to answer a couple of questions for you. Well, there is the possibility to put three questions from each side. Please, possibly, that the guests could start. On. Have you got a question? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. First, a question to uh, President Bush. Should wait, wait, wait. How many questions Please. are you going to ask? Oh, just a couple. Sir. Yeah, that's right. Should the American people conclude there were some intelligence lapses before September 11th? And could you exp please explain why you oppose an independent commission to look into the matter and why you won't release the August 6th memo? Yeah. And quickly to you, sir, do you think there should be a regime change in Iraq? Uh, well, first of all, 
I've got great confidence in our CIA and FBI. I know what's taken place since the uh, attacks on September the 11th. Our communications uh, between the two agencies is much better than ever before. Uh, we've got much better, uh, doing a much better job of ensuring intelligence. Uh, I, of course, want the Congress to take a look at what took place prior to September the 11th. But since it deals with such sensitive information, uh, in my judgment, it's best for the ongoing war against terror that the investigation be done in the Intelligence Committee. There are committees set up with both Republicans and Democrats who, uh, who understand the obligations of upholding our secrets and our sources and methods of collecting intelligence. Uh, and therefore, I think it's the best place uh, for Congress to take a good look at, uh, at the events leading up to September the 11th. The other question? Oh, yeah. Well, one of the things that is very important, Ron, is that the information given to the President uh, be, uh, uh, be protected because we don't want to give away sources and uses and methodology of uh, intelligence gathering. And uh, one of the things that we're learning is in order to win this war on terror, we've got to have the best intelligence gathering possible. And not only have we got to share intelligence uh, between friends, which we do, but we're still at war. we still got uh, threats to the homeland that we've got to deal with. And it's very important for us to uh, not uh, hamper our ability to wage that war. And so there are ways to uh, gather information uh, to help improve the system uh, and without jeopardizing the capacity for us to gather intelligence. And those are the ways I support. Saddam Hussein is... Saddam Hussein is a dictator, there can be no doubt, nothing else, and he uh, does uh, act without uh, looking after his people at all whatsoever. We're agreed when it comes to that. And we're also agreed in the fact that uh, it is up to the international community of states to uh, go in and exercise a lot of political pressure in the most marked possible way. The United Nations have decided to do so as well. We need to pressurize him so that international arms inspectors can get into the country to find out what weapons of mass destruction uh, can be found in his hands. I mean, there is no difference there between President Bush and myself when it comes to the assessment of this situation. We then obviously also talked about the question as to what uh, should happen in the future, what could happen happen in the future. I have taken notice of the fact that His Excellency the President does think about all possible alternatives, but um, despite what people occasionally present here in, in rumors, there are no concrete military plans of attack on Iraq, and that is why for me there is no reason whatsoever to speculate about when and if and how. I think such speculation should be forbidden. That certainly is not the right thing for a chancellor, and, and I am in this position. We will be called upon to take our, our decision if and when after consultations, and we've been assured that such consultations are going to be happening, and then we'll take a decision. And before that, I think we should not speculate about serious questions like this one. Mr. President, Herr Bundeskanzler, looking beyond Iraq, given the fact that Syria, too, in U.S. terminology, is a state sponsor of terrorism. Given the fact that Saudi Arabia is anything but a democratic, rule of law, pluralistic society, how do both of you want to, to have this whole region, the Middle East, look like once the fight against terror is over? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, would you care to go first, Mr. Chancellor? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be glad to answer it, if you like. Uh, first, you need to know that uh, in order for the region to be peaceful and hopeful, uh, there must be a resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I, I believe that strongly. And that's why my government um, and I feel strongly that we've got to uh, work toward a vision of peace that, uh, that includes two states living side by side. Uh, and 
The positive news is that uh, many Arab leaders understand that they have got to be a part of the process now. Uh, we spent a great deal of time talking to uh, the Saudis, for example. You mentioned the Saudis. They, uh, they must be a party to the process. They have uh, sometimes in the past the process has not gone forward because there hasn't been, as we say in America, the buy-in by the parties. They haven't been a party to the process. And I'm pleased to report, uh, as you can probably see in your newspapers, they are now. They're involved. I think one of our, and the reason I mention that is because I think their involvement to a process that I'm optimistic will succeed will then enable us to continue to more likely have an effect on promoting values that we hold dear values of uh, rule of law and democracy and minority rights. Uh, the institutions of change are more likely to, uh, to be effective with our ability to achieve uh, a, a peace in the Middle East. And so much of the ability to promote reform, which we're for, hinges on our uh, abilities and capacities to get something done. That's going to take a while, I believe, but nevertheless we are making progress. And uh, my administration spends a great deal of time uh, on the Middle East because we understand it is a linchpin for uh, convincing regimes uh, to adopt you know, the habits of freedom that sometimes we take for granted in our respective countries. Well, I don't think I've got to add a lot to what's been said, but possibly so much. I think um, there cannot be peace in the Middle East without the United States of America and without them being active in this field. And it was not without reason that I pointed to the tremendously important speech of the President. It's very important, and that is why we support uh, the efforts towards peace undertaken by the United States, but also by all other members of the so-called quartet. We're supporting Supporting this in the framework uh, of the European Union, but we're also doing it through bilateral channels. And my impression is, and here yet again, I fully agree with the President uh, that uh, a certain degree of progress is visible in this process. Now, obviously, we cannot be satisfied with a degree of process, but still, we have moved a little bit, and there is no alternative to the way that uh, the President just described. There is no such thing as a magic formula to solve this tremendously difficult problem. Nobody has such a formula, and that is why I think uh, the task that the President just described is uh, certainly one that needs to be seriously supported by the European Union and us bilaterally. Thanks very much. Fine man. Fine man. Mr. President, uh, we'll, see, we'll see that once he's put his question. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. When you meet with uh, President Putin tomorrow, how are you going to talk him into ending nuclear cooperation with Iran? Well, that's, uh, that's, that's going to be a topic. Uh, one way to make the case is that if you arm Iran, you're liable to get the weapons pointed at you. That you've got to be careful in dealing with a country like Iran. Uh, this is a country that doesn't... Uh, it's not transparent, it's not open, it's run by a, a group of extremists who, uh, who fund uh, terrorist activity, who clearly hate our mutual friend Israel. And, uh, you know, it's very unpredictable. And therefore, a, uh, Russia needs to be concerned about proliferation into a country that might... Uh, uh, view them as an enemy at some point in time. And if Iran gets a weapon of mass destruction deliverable by a missile, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for uh, all of us, including Russia. So that's how I'm going to make the case. We've got a lot of work to do with Russia. I will continue to make the case. As you know, Steve, I have brought that subject up ever since I started meeting with Vladimir Putin. The good news is uh, we're, our relationship is... Uh, is a friendly relationship. 
that I view President Putin as a friend, I view Russia as a friend, not as an enemy. And therefore, it's much easier to solve these difficult issues than issues like proliferation amongst friends. And uh, I'm, I want to appreciate the Chancellor's kind words about uh, tomorrow's uh, treaty signing. It's going to be uh, a positive development for America and I believe a positive development for Europe. And then, of course, we're going to Rome afterwards. And that, too, will be a positive development for Europe and America. And it is within the, you know, it's in this positive relationship and positive atmosphere that we're more likely to be able to achieve a satisfaction on nonproliferation. Has one. Um, uh, your government does not seem to, ha to be very specific right now when it comes to uh, plans uh, to attack Iraq. Is that true, sir? Um, and could you nevertheless uh, try to explain to the German people what your goals are uh, when it comes to Iraq? Yeah. And secondly, um, by German standards, Germany has uh, already shouldered a huge uh, burden in military terms in the fight against terrorism. Are you satisfied with that or do you want Germany to do more? Um, first, uh, what the Chancellor told you is true. Of course it is. <laughs> I'm surprised anybody would doubt your word, <laughs> Chancellor. <laughs> uh, yes, look, I mean, he, he, he knows my position and the world knows my position about Saddam Hussein. Uh, he's a dangerous man. He is a dictator who gassed his own people. He's had a history of uh, incredible human rights violations. And he is a, you know, it's, it's dangerous to think of a scenario in which a country like Iraq would team up with an al-Qaeda type organization, particularly uh, if and when they have the capacity, had the capacity, or when they have the capacity to deliver weapons of mass destruction via ballistic missile. And that's a threat. It's a threat to Germany. It's a threat to America. It's a threat to civilization itself. And we've got to deal with it. We can play like it's not there. We can hope it goes away. But that's not going to work. That's not going to make us safer. And I told the Chancellor that I have no war plans on my desk, which is the truth. And that we've got to use all means at our disposal to deal with Saddam Hussein. And uh, uh, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the German Chancellor's understanding of the threats of weapons of mass destruction. And they're real. Now, I know some would play like they're not real. I'm telling you they're real. And if you love freedom, it's a threat to freedom. And so we're going to deal with it. And we'll deal with it in a respectful way. The Chancellor said uh, that I promised consultations. I will say it again. I promised consultations with our close friend and ally. We will, we will exert a unified diplomatic pressure. We will share intelligence. Uh, we, uh, we love freedom. And so does, the, so does the Chancellor. And we cannot allow... Um, these weapons to be in a position that will affect history. Listen, history has called us to action. You know, I don't want to be in a position where we look back and say, why didn't they lead? Where were they when it came to our basic freedoms? And uh, we are going to lead. What was your other part of your question? That's what you get for asking long questions or yeah, what I get for answering long answers. <laughs> yeah, that's perfectly all right. Uh, the second question was, uh, sir, that uh, Germany has already shouldered oh, a yeah. huge burden yeah. in military terms, and do you expect more? Is that, uh, or do you Germany, think that's sufficient, sufficient? Germany has shouldered a significant burden, and we are very grateful for that. Uh, the Chancellor and I talked about uh, how to make sure we complete the task in Afghanistan, which is to continue chasing down the killers, by the way, and to find them before they hit us but as well as to leave institutions behind so that Afghanistan can run herself, so Afghanistan can be a peaceful nation, uh, so Afghanistan is, uh, it can function. And uh, we both recognize that our presence is going to have to be there for, for, a, you know, for quite a while. And uh, the Chancellor made that commitment, and I appreciate that. I'm very satisfied with the commitment of the German, German government. Yes, Terry. Thank you, sir. On the subject of weapons of mass destruction, the strategic arms agreement you'll sign in Moscow does not address what many people say is now the greatest threat posed by the Russian arsenal of weapons of mass destruction. That's proliferation to terrorists or rogue states because of insufficient security. 
what specific plan do you have to address that issue with mm -hmm. President Putin? Do you believe the Russian government is doing a good job securing these weapons? And what do you say to critics of this arms deal who say that by taking the material off the warheads, you provide more opportunities for terrorists to get it? <laughs> well, I guess to start with the critics, I say, would you rather have them on the launchers? Would you rather have the warheads pointed at people? I would think not. Uh, secondly, uh, this issue about the so-called loose nuke issue has been around for quite a while. This isn't anything new. Uh, this is a problem that, uh, that we are jointly uh, are working on. Uh, as you know, Terry, and others may not know, we've got what's called Nun Luger, which is a significant expenditure of taxpayers' money to help Russia uh, dispose of and dismantle uh, nuclear warheads, which we're willing to do. As a matter of fact, the O3 budget is nearly a billion dollars toward that end. We're working with uh, uh, Chancellor Schroeder on what's called 10 plus 10 over 10. Ten billion dollars from the U.S., ten billion from uh, other members of the uh, G7 over a 10-year period to help Russia uh, securitize uh, the dismantling, the dismantled nuclear warheads. And uh, President Putin understands that. He understands the need to uh, uh, work closely with all of us. Listen, he understands that a, uh, some, a, a, a loose nuke could affect his security as it affects somebody else's security. He's a wise man. He, he's, he's aware of the, of the issues that we confront. Uh, it's why he's one of the uh, best partners we have on the war against terror. He understands the implications and consequences of terror. And uh, he also recognizes that a nightmare scenario is a... Uh, you know, a dirty bomb or some kind of nuclear bomb in the hands of, uh, on the hands of any kind of terrorist organization. That's the fire. Last question. Mr. President, Herr yes. Bundeskanzler, uh, Mr. President, you are visiting a kind of ghost town around here. Do you feel a bit pity about not to meet the, uh, the Berlin people directly? <laughs> this is at first. And then secondly, when discussing ways to find worldwide peace, did you discuss on social and environmental matters too? This means, is there a chance that you come back to the table to sign the Kyoto Treaty and what no. are your... Uh -huh. <laughs> but then what are your aims concerning the Johannesburg Summit in August? Will you take part on it on or under which conditions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Part one of a four-part question. Um, I live in a bubble. That's what happens when you're the president. So unfortunately, I don't get to see as much of Berlin as I'd like to see. It's, uh, it's just life. Uh, so when I come back at some point in my life, Mr. Chancellor, you can show me around. We'll go fishing together. <laughs> I, no, I don't guess, of course. Whether it be in Berlin or Moscow or anywhere else. I mean, I'm a person who likes... Uh, I like to meet people. I like, uh, you know, I, uh, I enjoy people. Um, I had one small glimpse of Berlin last night when we went to a restaurant. It was my pleasure to shake hands with everybody or most everybody in the restaurant. I enjoy that. It frustrates me not to be able to, to see this uh, uh, growing city. Um, but that's just life in the bubble. That's just what happens when you're the president. And uh, uh, I knew that going in, so I'm not grappling about it. Um, yeah, I, the human condition is very important to me. I mean, it is, and that's uh, one way to make sure that um, that the terrorists uh, are less likely to be effective in their recruiting is to promote those conditions necessary for human beings to realize their full potential, such as good health and good education and prosperity, those uh, habits necessary for the growth of prosperity. And uh, I will address that in my speech uh, to the Bundestag. And uh, I, uh, I don't know whether or not you followed, but we've laid out an initiative called the New Millennium Fund where after three years our government will be spending five billion dollars a year new money for development. And that money is going to go promote uh, uh, two, two countries which are willing to fight corruption and promote rule of law. Look, you can, you, can, 
you can give all kinds of money to corrupt societies, but it's not going to help the people. It'll help the few. And uh, I'm tired of that. I want to encourage reforms in society that help people. You know, I'm desperately concerned about AIDS. I know the Chancellor shares my uh, grief. And we've put a significant amount of money on the table. But eventually I hope to see a strategy that'll work. It's one thing to commit money. It's another thing to insist that the money actually work and start saving people's lives. And when that happens, we'll commit more money. So you bet we're going to talk, we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about the human conditions necessary uh, to uh, really uh, make sure the whole world is able to be free and at peace. Thank you all. Vielen Dank, meine Damen und Herren. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This way, this way.